Father, thank you for this morning, God. Thank you, uh, Lord, for the, the, the freedom, God. Let's just keep it in perspective. The freedom we had this morning to worship you. God, the freedom we had to meet together and to gather together uh, in your name. We've had that freedom this morning, God. The freedom to right now look at the word of God and to have it uh, get inside of us. God, the freedom to have the word of God on somebody's final tablet here this morning or, or their Bible in their possession. Lord, the, the, <coughs> the freedom that we have to even speak out the name of Jesus publicly. God, the freedom that we have today to do what we do in this room and have it go through a camera and out there to people's homes or phones or wherever it is that they're uh, listening to it. God, we are blessed with so many freedoms and liberties and we don't want to focus on the other stuff, but we just say thank you this morning, God, that we're here. Thank you that we're able to gather. And I just pray right now, Holy Spirit, would you open our eyes to see things that we haven't seen before, open our ears to hear what the Holy Spirit wants to say to each individual in this room. And Lord, as we walk out of this place today, I pray that we would walk out of this place more in love with you, God, more encouraged to be the men and the women of God that we're called to be, and strengthened, Father, for the battle that we face in our lives as we continue to be people that stand on the truth of God's word and live and reflect the, the life of God and the person of Jesus to the community around us, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. If you've got a Bible there, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. We've been uh, going on a bit of a journey for a few months now and, and we will continue to do it for a bit longer where we've been looking at the person of the Holy Spirit. Um, who, who needs the Holy Spirit? Who, 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 oh, okay, half of you do, that's awesome. The rest of you, keep going. At some point you're going to crash and burn and realise that you can't do this Christian life in your own strength. Who knows that? Who knows that you can't, you can't win this spiritual battle just relying on your own intelligence, your own personality, maybe your own charisma. How many of you know you can't do it? Um, the, the beautiful thing is this, that God knows as well. And, that's, and Jesus knew too. And that's why Jesus said, when I go, I'm not going to abandon you. It's not like Jesus came, uh, said, hey, here I am, and then disappeared and left us all to our own devices. When he came down, he said, here I am, and I'm going to remain with you, but just in a different way. I'm going to go back to the Father, and I'm going to send the Spirit, and the Spirit's going to come, and he's going to be the comforter. He's going to come, and he's going to be your helper. He's going to come, and he's going to guide you into truth. He's going to come, and, and he's going to remind you of the things that God has spoken to you. He's going to come and dwell inside of you, and as he does that, all the inherent characteristics and power and virtue of who the Spirit is comes and dwells inside you as well. So you receive that dunamis, that inherent power of the Holy Spirit in your life. So we're not doing this journey alone, and it's that power of the Holy Spirit and presence of the Spirit in us that actually gives us a shot at even living what we would call this victorious Christian life. Um, in Ephesians, it, it's a really great book if you get a chance to read it through. Um, Paul, Paul's in a fairly relaxed state when he writes this book, by the way. I think he's in, in, in prison in Rome at the time, uh, but he's under a fairly loose house arrest. It's not like prison with shackles and bound up with rats running around his feet and stuff. He's under house arrest. He's allowed to have friends and, and visitors and people. They're coming and sitting with him and leaving. They're free to do that. Um, so he's in a fairly relaxed state. So Ephesians is not a book where he's writing it under duress or pressure or trying to deal with a major issue that he's heard uh, is going on in a particular uh, church location like some of his other letters. It's a fairly relaxed uh, book and in it he begins by expanding on, he tells us who we are in God, he tells us about our identity. Uh, he's unpacking the great things that God has done for us and, 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 and who, we, who we're called to be. He, he's, he's telling us how God sees us. He's giving us uh, an outline of some of the things that God has given to us and so on on this journey. And there are several references. Um, I'll just throw a few out just to lay a bit of a foundation for where we're going. Uh, in, in Ephesians uh, uh, 4.1, he says, As a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you, live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. He's talking about the way you live your life. I want you to live your life worthy. Of, of all these things I've told you previously, who you are, what God's done for you, how he set you free, the things he's given you, I want you to live. The, your response to that is that you should live life a certain way down here on planet Earth. Um, he goes on, uh, Ephesians um, 5, he says, Be imitators of God, therefore as dearly loved children, and live a life of love. Again, he's speaking about not just knowing things, but he's saying because of what you now know, and because of what's inside of you, the Holy Spirit, what's dwelling in you, because of that, uh, it's not just information for information's sake. It should uh, elicit a response from you. And the response is this. It's how you live your life. 
It's what your life looks like, not just what you talk about, but your life and how it lives. Um, go on further in, in Ephesians 5 and uh, uh, verse 8. He says, you were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Live as children of light. There's that word again, live. Live as children of light. Uh, verse 10, find out what pleases the Lord. So if you're going to live this life, find out what pleases God as a guide to how you're going to live your life down here on planet Earth. In, in, in verse 15, he says, be very careful then how you live your life. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity <coughs> because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. So he spends a lot of time outlining who we are, um, who God has made us to be because of the cross, what that means that we are able to be transformed into and who we've become. And then he gets to this passage in verse uh, uh, 18 and 19, which is what I want to focus on this morning in Ephesians 5. And we all know this passage because we've heard it a, a lot of times before. Uh, Ephesians 5 verse 18 to 21. It says this, it says, Do not get drunk on wine which leads to debauchery. How many of you use the word debauchery in a sentence this week? Anybody? <laughs> no? It's not a really commonly used word, is it? Uh, it means an abandoned uh, life given over to sensual pleasures, is what it means. And what he's saying is don't get drunk on wine, which leads to just this, this abandonment to whatever whim or whatever feeling or whatever expression or whatever thing is going on. Uh, and, and, and we've all seen people who've been intoxicated and, and you know, they, 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 they're basically abandoning all reason, abandoning self-control and giving themselves over to the impetus, the control, the compulsion of something other than uh, themselves. And he says, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, here's an alternative for you. Because of everything I've told you to do, here's an alternative. Don't be drunk with wine. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Don't get drunk with wine. Be filled with the Spirit. In other words, I've just outlined to you this life that God has given to you, who you are, um, uh, how you should live this life, how you should filter your decisions and so on through. And, 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 and now he's saying, and you need to live it though. So it's not enough just to know uh, this is what I should look like, uh, but you need to actually now go that next step and go, okay, I'm going to start living this stuff. I've got to do the doing. It's not enough just to know the knowing. I've got to do the doing. And then he gets to this point and he says, how are you going to do the doing? He says, well, here's the deal. Don't get drunk on wine, which loosens your inhibitions, which, which, in which you lose that whole ability to control yourself. Let me give you a bit of background here. Anyone ever heard of a guy called Bacchus? Yep. Yep. Okay, good. I'm going to talk about a different Bacchus than the guy you probably know. Uh, this Bacchus was not a, but a butcher or a, a baker down the road or the guy that mowed your lawn. Bacchus was a, a Roman god. And Bacchus was, was considered to be the god of uh, uh, environment, fertility, and wine. And uh, Bacchus actually had a Greek uh, counterpart, and some of you may have heard of the Greek god Dionysus. Anyone heard of Dionysus? Dionysus was the Greek uh, counterpart, Greek version of Bacchus. And uh, they were the gods of environment, of fertility, and of wine. And um, by the time Paul writes this letter in Ephesus, um, the, the cult, the, the worship of Dionysus is, is pretty much right across the whole known world at the time. It had expanded and grown. And one of the practices, part of the common practices of those that worship Dionysus was that, that when they got together to celebrate, they would imbibe with wine, they would drink alcohol. And they would drink and drink and drink and drink and drink. They would drink themselves into a stupor. What would happen is when they were drunk, the priests of Dionysus would get up and in a drunken state, the priests would prophesy over the people and would prophesy the will of their God. Uh, the people would get drunk. And the belief was that the more intoxicated we got and the less control we had, the more we laid down our own self-control, we were giving ourselves over to the control of something else, Right? And what they believed they were giving themselves over to the control of was to the control of the God, Dionysus. Therefore, whatever they did in that drunken state was living out the will of God. This is the way that they uh, perceived it. So when we think about that as a little bit of a background to this passage here that Paul's writing to them, if we go uh, uh, back, um, Paul says, say in verse 14 onwards, he says, This is why it said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead. Christ will shine on you. And he says, be very careful then how you live. There's that, that life again. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. In other words, you don't have to get drunk and give yourself over to foreign gods and those gods take a hold of you. They basically move you out of the way and everything you do from then on is the will of God. 
In other words, those people didn't really understand what the will of God was. So we had to get drunk and get ourselves out of the way because there was no possible way that we could live the will of God if we were in control. Paul's contrasting that with Christians going, no, no, it's different for us. We can know the will of God and we can be in control and compelled by something other than wine and alcohol and that compulsion and that compelling is what enables us and pushes us towards the will of God that we're actually able to know. We don't need to go into some mystical realm and get ourselves out of the way to know the will of God our God is a father who speaks to his children. Amen? Our God is a God who's for us, not against us. Now, I just want to talk uh, this week and just focus on this issue of um, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. The emphasis that Paul's writing here, do not be drunk with wine, is just the contrast. It's not the point. It's not the main focus. These guys knew exactly what he was talking about when he said, hey, guys, come on. We, we don't get drunk with wine. They would have automatically gone, yeah, we know exactly what you're talking about because we see it happening all around us. Many of us have come out of that background. We know exactly what you're saying. So they're hearing him go, you don't need to get drunk on wine and, and allow the wine to be the thing that compels and pushes you towards doing what the will of God is. Be filled with the Spirit and allow the Spirit to compel you towards the will of God. Uh, Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27, I think it is, it says, uh, speaking of our salvation, prophetically speaking ahead of that time when the Spirit would be sent to us. Uh, Ezekiel writes and he says that, that um, uh, yeah, I'll take out your heart of stone, I'll give you a heart of flesh. He says, I'll take out your dead spirit and I'll put in your spirit. And then he says, and I'll place my spirit in your spirit and I will cause you to walk in my ways. In other words, from the inside will be a compulsion, a strength, a, a pushing that will urge you towards doing the will of God and away from the will of the flesh and all these other things. This is what he's talking about. He says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. <laughs> now that word filled, by the way, in, in, in the Greek, that word literally means be continuously filled with the Spirit. It's not a one-off thing. It's not saying get filled and that's it, you're done. It's saying, be continuously filled with the Spirit. In other words, you might have been filled yesterday, but you've got to get filled again. You might have been filled the day before, but you've got to get filled again. So as believers, we've got to learn that, that just because we received the Holy Spirit at one point, that we don't just leave it to be like giving you one cup of water and one sandwich and saying, get through the rest of your life with it. That's enough. No, 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 you keep going back for more water. You keep going back for more food, more sustenance, more stuff for your physical body. And Paul's saying this is the way that a believer lives a life worthy of the calling. This is a way that we can understand the will of God. This is the way. Basically, this is the path to what we would call Christian maturity. Is you can't do it on your own. The, the pathway to Christian maturity is to learn to be continuously filled with the Spirit. Learn to be continuously filled filled with the Spirit. Now let me just, just quickly brush over a couple of things I want you to understand. Um, D.L. Moody, the great uh, American evangelist, he was asked once why he needed to be filled continually with the Holy Spirit. And his response was this. He said, because I leak. <clears throat> because I leak. I love the concept of what Moody's saying. Um, but but the, I guess the picture is not completely clear. We don't leak in the sense that we get to a point where the Holy Spirit completely runs out of us and as a believer, you suddenly find yourself in a place where you have zero Holy Spirit. That's not what he's saying. Uh, let me give you an example of somebody in the Bible, very clearly that we can quickly look at, who, ex who probably expressed this concept of leaking, okay? And somebody that was filled more than once, if we believe what these ancient writers wrote, and I do. Um, if we think about the, the Apostle Peter, in John chapter 20, verse 22, it says this, after Jesus was resurrected and he's spending time with his disciples and he's going to go off and disappear, <coughs> head back up to heaven, before he sent the Holy Spirit down, here's what uh, uh, he says to his disciples. Uh, John records this in John 20, 22, And with that, he being Jesus breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this is one of the very obscure passages in the New Testament that not a lot of people talk about and a lot of theologians uh, are very uh, averse to building doctrines on it because it's not something that we see anywhere else. None of the other writers record the fact that Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit before he went up to heaven and, and the day of Pentecost. Yet John does. Now, a couple of reasons why I take this passage seriously. Number one, because John recorded it. John was an actual eyewitness. The guy writing this was not getting a story from somebody else, as some of the gospel writers did. Um, he was an, a dead set eyewitness. He was there the day that this happened. He was one of the disciples standing there, and he's recalling to mind later in life, he's, he's wanting to write down a history of his, his journey with Jesus and so on. And so he writes this down, and it's, 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 it's impressed enough upon him 
that he puts it down in this volume that we have, that we call the, the, uh, the book of John. And he writes down that in that moment, Jesus actually breathed on us. He said to us, receive the spirit, and he breathed on us. Now, in terms of the context and the framework of that particular language and the way that's used, there's, it's very, very rare, the phraseology of that. It's reflected only, I think, one other time in the Greek translation of the Bible, and it's way back in Genesis chapter 2. Way back in Genesis chapter 2, when God said that he formed man of the dust of the earth, and then what did he do? He breathed on him, and man became a living spirit. So way back in, John chapter, uh, in Genesis 2, we've got this story of man being formed, but yet no life, no spiritual life. God breathes his spirit in and man comes to life, right? And here we have a similar thing happening. John's recording and saying basically the same thing happened to us. We were spiritually dead. Even though we were walking with Jesus, we, we were spiritually dead. We didn't have his spirit. And before Jesus went, he breathes on us and he gives us his spirit, which makes sense because those guys were going to have to be uh, walking quite solid with God, obedient to Jesus, end up in an upper room, preach the gospel and so on uh, when the spirit came down again. So according to him, according to John, they received the spirit before the day of Pentecost, just this group of disciples. The second reason why I believe it is because it's actually written here in what we call the Bible. These 66 uh, ancient documents written over 1,600 years that God had collected and, and, and contained and kept together so that in 2021 we could sit here in Ganelava and learn about the character and nature of our God from these ancient documents. He wanted that recorded. That little passage could have been gone, but it's there for a reason. So while some theologians don't want to build doctrines around it and dance around it too much, I want to just say that I believe that these guys received the Spirit there. John said it. The Holy Spirit wanted me to read it, wanted me to understand it that way. And it's referenced in the exact same comparison to what we see in Genesis chapter 2. That tells me enough to think that on this particular moment, Peter received the indwelling, indwelling Holy Spirit. Fast forward. And we go to Acts chapter 2 uh, in verse 4. And we all know the story of the day of Pentecost where the Spirit comes down again. It says, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Who's all of them? Well, it's a bunch of these other guys, including Peter, who actually happened to be there that day when Jesus breathed on them. So here we have Jesus breathing on Peter, receiving the indwelling Spirit. Then Acts chapter 2, again, we see the Spirit fall upon him. And it says, for a second time, Peter was filled with the Spirit. Fast forward to Acts chapter 4. Peter and John have preached the gospel they have gotten in trouble. They've been told by the authorities not to preach and, and uh, been, been, been uh, kicked out of town and, and run back to their uh, uh, buddies, the other disciples, other believers, and they're in a room and they're praying together. And it says in Acts 4, 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all what? Filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. So here we have an example of one guy, Peter, who's received the indwelling presence of the Spirit when Jesus breathed on him, just like you and I did the day that we bowed our knee to Jesus. If you have given your life to God, be very clear, and we've already gone over this about a month ago, you have the indwelling presence of the Spirit in your life. Sometimes we don't feel it. Sometimes we don't want to believe it. But biblically, if we're going to believe what Jesus spoke, if we're going to believe what these writers wrote, then we need to believe what they, what they, what they wrote and believe what they spoke. And that is that you have the Holy Spirit indwelling inside of you. You cannot be a believer and not have the Holy Spirit. I think Paul writes about that, Romans chapter 8. You cannot, have, you cannot be a believer and not have the Spirit. Amen? So if you're a believer in this room, you have the indwelling Spirit. Well, Peter received that, but then again in Acts chapter 2, it says even though he had the indwelling Spirit, the Spirit fell upon him. And it says again in Acts chapter 4, even though he already had the indwelling Spirit, he was filled again for a second time. So we see in the word of God and the life of these disciples that they were actually continuously filled. There's a, there's, a, there's a picture there of these guys being continuously filled, not just filled once and once for all. Now, very quickly, again, when we look at the concept of being filled, there are two different types that we see in the book of Acts, two different types of filling. And let me just go really quickly through this because I want to end up at verse 18 and talk a little bit about that. The first one is when God sovereignly pours his spirit upon us for a specific purpose. There are moments in the book of Acts where God pours his spirit upon people who already had the indwelling spirit, but he pours it upon them for a particular purpose or a task or a moment. 
uh, where they need it for something. Um, Acts 4.31, the one we just read. After they've just prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God boldly. So there's a connection between they were already indwelt with the Spirit, but they prayed, the Spirit fell upon them, and the result of that was so that they could go and preach the word of God boldly, which was probably something that some of them were afraid to do because we'd just been warned and these guys had been beaten and told, don't you speak this name again. You can imagine some people perhaps feeling a little bit timid about that, but they got together and prayed and the Holy Spirit, God just sovereignly pours his Spirit out upon those same people who already had the Spirit. And the result of it is he pours the Spirit upon them so they can go and preach the Word of God boldly. So the Spirit poured upon them for a particular task. Acts chapter 7, verse 55. This is Stephen. This is uh, uh, when Stephen's getting martyred. And it says this in verse 55. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. In that moment when Stephen was about to face martyrdom, what a beautiful picture. It's like God pours his Spirit upon him again in that moment so that he can face martyrdom. And he looks up and he has a a heavenly vision. God pours his spirit upon people. And in that moment, they get boldness to preach. God pours his spirit upon Stephen here. And he's able to face martyrdom. And he looks up and he doesn't even talk. He's not even caught up in the stones and the stuff that is hitting his body. He just has this vision of Jesus. And he looks up at God. And I wonder often today whether that's that's something that God does for martyrs, people that stand up for their faith. That there's a grace upon them that in that moment, the spirit fills them again. And they just get taken to another place. And they probably don't even feel the stones and they don't feel all that stuff isn't it a beautiful picture of somebody giving up their life for the gospel Acts 13 9 and Saul who was also called Paul he's filled with the Holy Spirit he looks straight at Elimus and says be blind so we've got a situation here where Paul's preaching the gospel to uh, one of the Roman rulers and this Roman ruler is very open and wanting to hear more and this sorcerer is there and he starts turning this Roman ruler away getting in his ear going don't listen to Paul it's, it's rubbish don't know And Paul has this moment where he says, and Paul, filled with the Spirit, turned to him and said, back up, buddy. And he pronounced blindness upon that man. And it says straight away that a mist descended upon him and he was blind. He didn't just do that because he wanted to. Uh, The the, the writer, Luke, makes it very clear in that moment for for a task and a purpose to get this guy out of the way and to show this proconsul, this Roman leader, the power and glory of God, he was filled with the Spirit for a moment and bang, pronounces blindness. And this proconsul believed, you better believe he did, (laughs) when he saw that happen. Acts 13, 32. It says, And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Go back and read the story. They've been preaching the gospel in Antioch. They were run out of town, literally run out of town for preaching the gospel. But it says after that, they gathered with other believers. They prayed. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and joy. So the Spirit of God gave them joy to keep on going on the journey. And we see this time and time again. I bet you there are people in this room and you've experienced that kind of a feeling. There's been something you've needed to do. A moment where maybe you've had to confront somebody or, or a moment where you've been talking to somebody and you just know afterwards, where did that come from? That just wasn't me. Anyone relate to that? Those words, I don't know where those words come I don't know where that boldness came from in that moment to actually not back down. Normally I would back away from that, but I just stood my ground. I don't know where that came from. Anyone ever have a moment like that in their life? I remember being in India many, many years back and we were doing this massive big crusade down in South India, a new place I'd never been to, but uh, we got down there and they had the platform, the lights, and, and we just had a mass of people in this big uh, uh, paddock. <coughs> but I noticed when I was preaching that there was these uh, guys, this fence around the outside, and there was a group of guys on the outside of the fence and they weren't allowed in, they wouldn't come in. And I didn't know why, but I remember it stuck in my brain thinking, no, let them in, these people should all be in here. But they could hear through the loudspeakers. At the end of the message, we were praying for people and this gentleman uh, was standing just over here and I don't know why I did it to this day. All I can say is it was one of those moments where the Holy Spirit just filled me and I did something I wouldn't normally do. How many of you know I'm not the most touchy-feely man in the world? Anyone that knows me uh, knows... Hey, there you go, hands down. Um, I, I, I'm not an overtly touchy-feely uh, type of person. I remember the first time a, a, a man in a Christian setting walked up to me and gave me a hug. I literally pushed him away and ran about 1.5 kilometres from the place where we were but here I am this day and I finished preaching I look across and here's this this Indian man just standing there in his in his you know um, sort of beggarly like clothing is the best way I could put it and I looked across at him and I don't know why I walked straight over to that guy and I wrapped my arms around him and I hugged that man I hugged that man and he broke down sobbing and then I prayed for him afterwards I asked uh, one of the, the the people that were helping run the crusade I said what were these people doing out there And he said, well, they weren't meant to be in. He said, do you remember that person you walked up to and you hugged? I said, yeah. He said, well, he shouldn't have been in here because that man has AIDS. And all the AIDS people are outside. They're not allowed to come near anybody. 
I didn't know that, but I just remember something came upon me in that moment and I walked up to him and I hugged him. And we've all had moments like that where the Spirit just sovereignly in a moment fills us and we just know what to say. We know what to do. We, we've experienced those moments. That's one type of filling. The second type of filling that I see in the New Testament is this one that Paul's actually talking about. The first one is a sovereign act of God. But we find the one Paul talking about, there's a participatory place. There's a, there's a thing that we participate in in this sense of being continuously filled. And I want to just, with the little bit of time that we've got left, just look a little bit at that. A um, couple of quick things. Number one, when he says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. It's written in the Greek language as an actual command. It's not an option. In other words, it's not an option. He's saying, be continuously filled. If you're standing here today, he'd say to everyone in this room, be continuously filled. That's not an option. It's not a suggestion. I'm commanding you. You need to learn to live this life continuously filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not an option. It's actually a command in the Greek language. You will do this, is what Paul's saying. Um, secondly, it's a continual process, and we've already talked about that. The word means be continuously filled. Thirdly, it's for all believers. It's for all believers. It's not just for elite believers. It's not just a command for pastors or worship leaders. It's not just a command for small group leaders or people that run things. It's a command for anybody that calls upon the name of Jesus. Anybody that has the indwelling spirit in them who's bowed their knees to him. Anybody, if you fit that bill, then this is a command and it's a command to you this morning. You need to learn to be continuously filled with the spirit. And fourthly, it's actually about control or influence or compulsion. When I say control, I don't like using the word control because that's exactly what Paul was writing to when he was writing to these people saying, don't be drunk with wine. In other words, don't give yourself totally over to the control of... How many of you get sick of this? Uh, and again, maybe it's a bugbear of mine, but I'm going to say it anyway. You see something on the news and somebody got drunk. They drank too much or, or, and then they went and crashed a car or something and then the, the claim will be that the, go easy on them, Your Honour, because they were drunk. Go easy on them because they were intoxicated when the king hit that person. Well, if I was the judge, and thank God I'm not the judge, I would say, but the first time you put that in your system, in your mouth, you knew that if you put more in and more in and more in, if you continued that pattern of behaviour, that you would eventually end up in a place where you were not out of control. So while, yes, you may not have been in control of the steering wheel because you were drunk, you were in control of the process of getting there. See, sometimes we want to abdicate control of our life and blame everything else and everybody else and every situation, every circumstance. One thing I've learned in my life, and my life has not been easy, and many of you in this room are the same, but I, I might not be able to control what happened to me as a child, but I've had to learn to be in control of my responses to that as I've grown up. I can seek healing. I can seek help. I can talk to people. I, I can choose uh, forgiveness over bitterness and, and, and anger. And if, if it's hard to do that, then I can choose to talk to someone that can help me on that journey rather than just sit there and go, oh, it's just too hard. Uh, uh, and this is part of what Paul's saying to them, is he's contrasting being drunk, with the spirit, uh, being, being drunk on wine with being filled with the Spirit. And, and being filled with the Spirit doesn't mean that we get to a point where, as it is with being drunk, you're taken out of the picture and there's just some other thing doing everything through you. That's what we would call possession. And Jesus met some people that were possessed, but he didn't thumbs up them. He dealt with them and kicked the thing out that was taking possession of them because my life was given to me and ultimately I have control for it. Okay? So what Paul's saying here is don't give the control over by becoming inebriated with wine. Stay in control, but learn to be filled. Learn to come under the compulsion or the influence of the spirit that dwells inside of you. You see, being drunk or being filled with alcohol is the outcome of a continual pattern of behaviour. Amen. It's the outcome of a continual pattern of behaviour. I've had one, I have a second, I have a third, and I keep going, and the outcome is that we end up getting drunk. The more you drink, the more that alcohol has an effect on you, and the more it begins to shape you. It's the same with the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit is the outcome of a continual pattern of behaviour. The more you drink, the more the Spirit has an effect on you, and the more He shapes you your life. If I had a balloon here, I was going to use an illustration this morning. I, if I blew up a balloon, that balloon would be full of air, correct? But if I loosened the end of the balloon and, and the air went and I end up just a little flappy balloon here, right? But the fact of the matter is there's still air in that balloon. Is that right? There's still air. It's not devoid of air. There's still air in there. 
but the air on the inside is just not having an impact in helping that balloon take shape. It's, all the air is gone. And so if you can picture being filled with the Spirit a little bit like that, Paul says be continuously filled because it's what's on the inside of us that compels us and shapes us. It's not meant to be what's going on out here. It's meant to be what's on the inside of us, which is the indwelling Spirit. So here's the thing. If being filled is a command, then what are the continual patterns of behaviour that we need to get into our life that will lead us to being filled? What are the continual patterns of behaviour that we need to do? Well, here's the thing. Paul actually gives us the answer in the very next verse. Verse 18, verse 19 and 21 are all tied together. It's a little bit like this. Imagine asking the question, how do I get drunk? That's the end result. How do I get drunk? Process? Wine. That's the process. So Paul's already told them previously, don't get drunk on wine. In other words, uh, the end result of being drunk and the process is wine. You don't need that. But how do I get filled with the Spirit? Well, now he's going to tell us the process of how we get filled or live a life continuously filled with the Spirit. Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dis debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Verse 19. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Singing and making music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you come to a gathering on a Sunday morning? You, you come here and we sing some songs when we're allowed to and we haven't got masks on and, and life's kind of you know, a normal sort of service. You have some, some, some uh, the word of God's preached and you feel the Holy Spirit sort of poking at you and saying things to you. You grab a coffee and a bit of cake or whatever and you sit around and you're rubbing shoulders with other believers and you're talking about life. And then you get back in that car and how many of you feel just that little bit lifted? Anybody feel that experience? For many people, that's why I know some people that go, I won't miss a Sunday no matter what because I know I need that. It's like I get this injection. Anyone here like that? You get this little injection because you're around other believers in the presence of God corporately with people. You're worshipping. You're hearing the word of God and, and, and you just walk out with that little bit of a lift. Well, you, what, the reason you're feeling that little bit of a lift is because what you've done in that time is you've, you, you've actually participated in continually filling yourself with the Spirit by being in that kind of environment. That's exactly what you are doing. Let me just break down three continual habits or three continual patterns of behaviour that Paul says, if you want to learn to be continuously filled, get these three habits or patterns of behaviour as a regular part of your life. Number one, he says, speak to one another. Speak to one another. Not just about the weather. Not just about the football. Not just about your job, not just about your family. Nothing wrong with those kinds of conversations. They're normal and a part of life. But he says, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. In other words, what he's saying is, is speaking to one another about God and the things of God. What is God saying to you at the moment in your life? Where's God at work in your world right now? What are the questions that you have? What are your doubts that you're facing right now. Where do you see God putting his finger? Where do you see God taking you? Let's get a little bit of God. Here's what he's saying. He said, speak to one another with a bit of God conversation every now and then when we get together. Because it's amazing when you walk away from those conversations, it's the same thing. You just feel that little bit of a lift on the inside because we're bringing God into our conversations and making God a normal topic of discussion. Amen? Not just in church on a Sunday when someone stands up front and, and talks out of the Bible, but we're making spiritual conversation normal for all believers. If Jesus really is the most important thing in our lives, then why do so many of us find it so hard to have a conversation and bring him into it? Why is it so hard to talk about God? You ever feel that opposition on the inside of you when it comes to this kind of conversation? You know, I, I know people who, who, who love God, I don't doubt that. I, I believe with all my heart that they love God, they're saved, and if they were to pass from this earth to eternity, they'll spend eternity with Jesus, got no doubt about it. But for some reason, they, they, they check out of any type of spiritual conversation down here. You know what I believe it is? I believe because if this is really what Paul's saying, if this is really part of Paul's prescription on how you remain continuously filled, then of course the devil doesn't want you bringing God into conversations. Of course the devil doesn't want you speaking about God to other people or sharing with other people what's going on in your world. Where's God at? What's he saying? What's he doing? Uh, or, you know, of course the devil doesn't want you to have God conversations or spiritual conversations that revolve around Jesus. He doesn't want you doing that because he knows that that's one of the ways that you remain continuously filled with the Spirit. When I say that word continuously filled, here's another way that you can think about it. Continuously filled also equals completely focused. Completely focused. Continuously filled is another way, I believe, of saying completely focused. Completely focused on the presence of God, the indwelling Spirit in your 
life. The fact that God is with you when you're at home by yourself, when you're at home with your family, when you're at work, when you're playing sport, when you turn on the computer, when you're listening to those conversations, when you're having those arguments, God is with you the whole time. And Paul's saying that the first thing we need to do to, to the first part of the process of living a continuously filled life is learn how to have spiritual and God conversations, not just in your own mind. How many of you have wonderful God conversations in your own mind with yourself? I just want to see if I'm really weird here. Hands up if you do. I have the most amazing God conversations with myself. I'll just stand there and I'll, I will give myself the greatest advice with the proper things I'm facing. Or going. I just give, sometimes I feel like I'm the Dr. Phil of the church world. And, I, and I'm sitting on a couch by myself, next to myself, giving myself all the answers to all the problems, plucking out the word of God and using biblical examples and so on. But then when it comes to average everyday conversation, it just doesn't seem to flow as well. Anyone else? Like me? Yet Paul says this is part of one of those cap patterns of behaviour, continual patterns of behaviour that keep us continuously filled. He says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. How do you stay continuously filled? Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. Speaking to one another with God language. Speaking to one another. I wonder how many of us in this room, if I was to ask you to, 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 to number the amount of people that know in your life right now what God is doing and saying to you. I wonder if we could number them. Wonder, wonder how small for some of us that number is. wonder if some of us would sit here and go, well, actually, I keep my cards so close to my chest. I never talk about it. Nobody would really know what's going on in my life. Even with the doubts. If you've got doubts in your life, talk to people about them. How do doubts consume people? Doubts consume people because they keep the doubt to themselves and they don't bring it out. And then one day the doubt turns around and eats them. Bring your doubts out. The disciples had doubts. Everybody has doubts. But learn to speak to one another with psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. The word speak, it literally means to speak, to talk, to tell, to use words in order to declare one's mind and disguise one's thoughts. Let's be people that, that live continuously filled with the Spirit by speaking to one another in God language and having God conversations. I, I want to hear about the weather. I want to hear about your footy team. I do. I want to hear about all that stuff. But I want to hear about God in your life too. Tell me, what is he doing? What's he saying? Where is he? Let's stir one another on with the stories and testimonies of what God is doing in our lives. Number two, second thing is engage in worship to God. He says speaking to one another in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. Then he says singing and making melody in your heart to God. The first step is talking to other people, bringing God into that normal conversation realm, talking about what God is doing. That's one step towards being continuously filled. The second thing he says is singing and making melody in your heart to God. I'm not singing to you like Oklahoma. I'm singing now to God. Right? It's not the Christian musical, hey, Jesus loves us. And we all dance in time and everybody got up in their chairs and started, you know, see those movies and everything happens all at the right time. It's amazing. And I think, is life really like that? No. This one here is about engaging in worship to God. Engaging in worship to God. I went to an amazing church service the other day, actually, a really good church service. Um, and here's sort of how it went. Uh, people all turned up with great expectation. They were all excited to be there. They brought their voices. Uh, they unlocked their emotions for a couple of hours. They had their emotions going. They stood to their feet. They raised their hands. They entered into unity with a whole bunch of people that they probably wouldn't have had anything else in common of at all. Uh, Oh, hang on, no, that was a football game I went to the other week up the Gold Coast. Sorry, sorry, I was talking about a football game at a stadium. But basically, the, the idea is exactly the same, isn't it? These people came together, they got excited, they unlocked their emotions, they stood up, they clapped, they cheered, they put their hands in. They weren't ashamed about getting emotional about 13 men running around in canvas jackets. That's about what it is, chasing a piece of rubber. Yee! I can say that because my team's at the bottom and I don't care about football 2021. Corporate worship, engaging in corporate worship. He says, singing, singing and making melody in your heart to God. Not just coming along and singing a song, not just coming along mouthing a word, but he's saying really engaging in worship, not just with your mouth, but with your heart. Really engaging in gratefulness to God. Uh, even private worship. Uh, 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 any of you guys ever do this? You put worship on in your car and you're driving along and you're that really weird person in that... Uh, anyone ever do that? Has anybody here ever done that? Yeah? Yeah? Anybody ever seen someone do that? Yeah? Yeah, I've probably seen some of you do it, actually. And uh, so you're either the person doing it or you're watching somebody else do it. But you know what? What a beautiful thing. Just learning also, not just to have to come together to worship, but just private worship. 
Being people that make worship a part of your day, a part of your life. Chuck on a worship CD or, or, or even if it's not singing, go out in the backyard, look at the trees and just thank God for this incredible creation that he has made. You know, um, um, Go and look at your children while they're sleeping, not in a creepy way, but go and look at your children and just look at these intricately designed mini human being things and go, God, you're just amazing. That is going to end up like me one day. I'll leave that one alone. Engaging in worship, singing and making melody in our heart to God. So the, the, the first two things, how do we remain continuously filled? Number one, we're going to learn to speak to one another in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. Second, we're going to sing and make melody in our hearts to the Lord. And the third part of that, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And the last part of that, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. So the third thing is we're going to keep an attitude of gratitude. We're going to live, not just be grateful here and there, but we're going to cultivate and learn how do we have an attitude of gratitude. And it's not just being grateful for things. Paul's very specific, being grateful to God. See the focus? We're talking to one another about God. Our focus is God. We're singing and making melody in our hearts to God. What's our focus? It's not us. It's God. Always being grateful and having an attitude of gratitude, not just for the sake of how he's not awesome, but giving thanks for everything to who? To God. Can you notice in all these things what Paul is saying is that being continuously filled is really about being completely focused in your life. Don't decompartmentalise your faith. I've got my faith life over here and I've got the other stuff over here. If you live like that, you will never reach a place of spiritual maturity. And Paul's trying to say here, I've just outlined, live a life worthy, understand the will of God. Uh, You've been called to this, you've been called to that. The only possible way you're going to do that, Paul says, is not by getting drunk on wine and giving yourself over to the control of these. If you want to really live like that and know the will of God, then what you need to do is be continuously filled with the Spirit. Be completely focused on the Spirit and that's the only way you're going to be empowered to actually live this Christian life in a victorious and life-giving and fruitful way. Without that, you'll never be able to do it. Who remembers back in the sort of 80s, uh, 90s? I I, I got saved in the 90s and uh, I remember the whole drunk in the spirit thing. Everyone remember that? And and, and we interpreted, uh, and everyone was interpreting drunk in the spirit meaning you just had to look like you're off your nut on some kind of alcohol and if you did, then woo, we're drunk in the spirit. And I'm not saying God didn't do that. I'm not saying any. But what I'm saying is that's not what Paul's ever getting at. He's not saying, he's not replicating saying, you know how stupid you look and sound when you get off your nut on alcohol? Then if you just do that with the spirit, then we'll, but you haven't drunk, we'll say you've been filled with the spirit. He's not saying that. He's not saying that at all. What he's saying is that we need to learn to be continuously filled and the way we remain continuously filled is to constantly focus on the fact that that indwelling spirit is in me all the time. He's not leaving me. He's not going to leave me. When are we grateful? He says always. Being grateful always. And what are we grateful for? He says everything. The good, the bad, the ugly. Find a place of gratitude. Three ways, three ways that Paul says you can live a life continuously filled is is speaking to one another, bring God into our conversations on a daily basis. Secondly, engage in worship to God. Thirdly, choose to have an attitude of gratitude no matter what's going on in your world. Find the things that you can be grateful for. C.S. Lewis said this once. He said, isn't it funny how day by day nothing changes? But when you look back, everything's different. Isn't it funny how day by day nothing changes? But when you look back, everything's different. I want to finish today with a challenge. I want to throw a challenge at you. Yeah, everybody has these 30-day challenges, all the fitness gurus and everybody. 30 day, I want to throw a 30-day challenge at you today. And here's my challenge to you. I want to challenge us to be a community of people that live, not just read or be continuously filled. Isn't that an awesome passage? Let's be people that put into practice what Paul was trying to get these Ephesians to put into practice. So I'm going to challenge you for the next 30 days. Every day, I want you to find someone to have a God conversation about. Ask them the question, hey, what's God saying to you at the moment? How can I pray for you? Um, he, open up your own world. Hey, God's, God's speaking to me about this. Would you stand with me in prayer? Or, or I'm believing for this or whatever. Or, or maybe what did you read this morning when you picked up the word of God? What, what, tell me what you read this morning. What was the spirit of God saying to you? What was highlighted to you? Let, let's every day find someone. And if they don't live in your home, pick up the phone and give someone a call. It's only got to be a few minutes, but, but have a, a conversation like that with somebody. Secondly, find a place in your world every day to have 
have a little bit of worship. It might be in the car on the way to church. It might be uh, when everybody's gone to bed and, uh, or it might be when you go for a bit of a walk in the afternoon, whatever it is. I don't might care where it is. Uh, it's not so much about the process. It's about the outcome. The outcome is being continuously filled. So, so find someone that you can have a God conversation with every day for the next 30 days. Find some space in your world, even if it's just one song, just to abandon yourself in worship to God. And then thirdly, finish up your day by just sitting quietly and going, okay, God, I'm going to give you three things I'm grateful for today. God, here's number one, I'm grateful, God, to you for this. I'm grateful for this. I'm grateful for this. Continual patterns of behavior, Paul says. When you get drunk, it's a continual pattern of behavior. You start, the first drink doesn't really feel like it's doing much. And then the second one, maybe it starts to kick in. Then the third, then by the tenth, you can't remember you had the sixth. Okay? Because you're gone. Well, you know what? It's exactly the same. Start. Don't do it one day and go, well, that didn't make a difference. Continual patterns of behavior are what shape our future. It's what I do now consistently that creates the future I'm going to walk into down the track. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word this morning, God, and we thank you for uh, uh, God just being with us today. God, and again, we are grateful. God, we are grateful to be able to gather together. God, four square meters, masks, no singing. We are grateful that we can still get together. God, we are grateful that you are for us, not against us, God. We are grateful this morning, God. I'm, I'm thankful for the people that are in this room. I'm grateful for the people that took time this morning to join us online. And uh, Father, we just want to pray, uh, God, as we go into this week, that what we've heard here today wouldn't just be another great uh, uh, bunch of words that we heard from the front that we'll go home, we'll mull it over, we'll chew it up. Uh, maybe we'll give it a mark out of 10. But Lord, let it be something that we put into practice. God, let it be something that we do something with. God, as C.S. Lewis said, God, that just day by day we would do these things knowing that we're going to look back down the track in 30 days and we're going, to, we're going to know that everything's different because we've started to live a life continuously filled with the Spirit, not waiting for a crisis and having to cry out, not waiting till we feel depleted and empty and then feeling that we've got to run to church because we need that one drink every week. The Lord will be the ones coming into church on a Sunday carrying cups of water. We're so full, we want to pour out and give to somebody else that might be in need this morning, God. Let us be a community of faith like that. And Father, I also pray, uh, God, for these next seven days that, Lord, there are people out there that don't know you. God, they haven't had the encounters we've had. They, they weren't brought up, being pointed. They haven't been focused on you, God. So, Lord, would you use us this week, God, to tell somebody out there that doesn't know you, God, somebody out there that doesn't know how much you love them, how much you care for them, Father, that you have plans and purposes for their life and their good plans and purposes. God, would you, would you pick us? Would you use us to tell somebody this week about the goodness of God? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen.